Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to this organization to have me here and to give me this chance to make presentation in front of this venue. Uh, the, the topic that I want to talk uh, today about is um, economic and political reshuffle that I believe is happening in the world right now and uh, what to do about it, how to uh, survive this reshuffle. I believe that um, every, every once every 30 to 40 years, there is a political economic reshuffle that is happening in the world, which has its own losers and winners. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, for example, just after the Second World War, there was a major political reshuffle. Breaking down of Soviet Union was also a major political and, uh, and financial economic reshuffle that has, has had its own losers and winners. I believe that right now we are entering one more uh, political and economic reshuffle, and which can be very, very interesting one, but also very, very dangerous, especially for developing countries. Um, so what is happening right now, if you, if you look uh, at the situation politically, uh, we have this more of a um, nationalistic themes that, is, that, has, that are becoming very, very popular, in, especially in developed, uh, developed countries in Europe and the United States. You have the, we have this Brexit type of uh, situation, which is also developing in other countries in, U in Europe. We have Russia becoming also very, very active in international political scene. On the other hand, in economy, we have a situation where oil prices had its own shock on, on, uh, on economies of many developing countries in the region. But more importantly, very, very much more importantly, you have te technological developments. And what is happening with technological developments, uh, what it brings to the world is the following. It uh, brings uh, more uh, focus uh, and more uh, foreign direct investment flow into developed world rather than into developing countries. And it, it is the situation where we have, uh, and by the way, we can actually very clearly see this uh, technological change. This is uh, top 10 biggest companies in the world in 2010, 2015, and 2017. In 2010, out of top 10 richest companies in the world, there were only two technological companies. In 2017, you have already seven technological companies, and plus Berkshire Hathaway, which is, by the way, 20, 25% also technological company. So I believe that within next two to three years' time, in 2020, we will have all top 10 companies will be technological. So th this, is, this is, is happening in just recently, in just five to six, seven years' time. What does it mean to the world? It means that people, investors, would prefer to buy the most difficult land in California, pay highest taxes in California, hire most expensive entrepreneurs or most expensive labor in California, and still make huge money. And if, if in the past, developing world, like post-Soviet Union, like Africa, like Asia, were attractive for global investors, and money is within global investors, within global funds. Developing countries are not rich countries. They cannot bring investment funds. So money, which is in London, New York, or wherever, wherever it is, those money were used to go to developing world for a few reasons. They were used to go there because l land was cheap, labor was cheap, taxes were low, and, situation, and they could make money. They could make money on these investments. Now, the trend is totally different. Now you see that only during the last three years you have a situation where more money is going to developed world and less money is going to developing countries. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, this trend will continue. This is our forecast, uh, that this trend will continue because this reshuffle is ongoing reshuffle. We are just in the start of this uh, global economic reshuffle and it's going to continue. So here's the question. What's going to happen with developing countries? What's going to happen with Africa? What's going to happen with the post-Soviet Union countries? What's going to happen with Asia? Where there will be less and less inflow in these countries? Probably. With, with the trends that we see right now, it's going to happen. Where there will be less and less FDI. And I'm not talking about FDI only because of money flow. I'm talking about, about FDI as one of the main sources of know-how transfer. Let's face it. Most of the developing world are not technological developers. They are technological users. And in order for them 
to develop some kind of know-how, they need FDI. They need American, Japanese, other British companies coming in, building factories, transferring know-how, and teaching a local population with the new, uh, for, for the new technologies. And this is going to be the biggest problem. So, in this situation, what is the solution? What government should do? What international financial organizations should do? By the way, when I me talk about IFIs, I mean World Bank, I mean EBRD, EIB, all these international financial institutions, who, by the way, have played very, very interesting role and very important role up to now in developing countries. I mean, we can see serious reduction of poverty. We can see serious economic growth of developing countries. But now, is it time now for them to change? And I think the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because IFI is becoming outdated. Their uh, policies, their ways of, of intervening in developing world is becoming outdated. They need to adopt new, new policies. Uh, governments, on the other hand, have to adopt also new policies. It's impossible to survive as, the, as, 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 it, as they have been done doing up, up to now. The, new, the, the situation is totally new. And what I mean by new policies of governments, I call it Georgian reforms. It's, it's very selfish. It's very selfish from my side to, to call this type of package of reform, Georgia reforms. But I'll give, you couple, I'll give you a couple of figures for you to have idea. Georgia's transformation in 2004, 2010 was a truly fundamental transformation, which can be very much learned from Georgia by an, almost any developing country. Right now, I, am a, I have my own company, Reformatics, and we advise many, many governments in the world on, on business environment, on economic transformation. And we can actually see that Georgia reforms will work well, can work well in any, almost any developing country, in Africa, being, being in Asia, or, or in, maybe in, in Latin America. What, what do I mean by this Georgia reforms is the following. Imagine Georgia was named as one of the most corrupt country in the world in 2003. Out of 132 countries that was uh, uh, reviewed by Transparency International, Georgia was on 128th place. Can you imagine? We were, we were amongst the champions of, of corruption. If there was a world championship in corruption, Georgia would have been in finals definitely. Maybe playing against Nigeria in finals and losing or, 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 or drawing. The only countries that were behind us in 2003 were Nigeria, Tajikistan, uh, and I think Haiti. That's it. Uh, and Bangladesh, sorry, and Bangladesh. These were the only countries behind, uh, behind Georgia in 2004. In 2007, and this is only two, three year period, 2007, Georgia was amongst top 50 least corrupt countries in the world. In 2000, thank you. In 2010, Transparency International did a review of 180 countries asking one and the same question, have you or member of your family paid bribe in past 12 months? In Georgia, only 5% said yes in 2010. We are talking about only five to six months period. Uh, e EU average was 5%. US was 5%. Georgia only 4% said yes. EU average was 5%. US was 5%. The only countries that did better than us we are actually Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, Belgium, uh, Netherlands, South Korea, UK, which I don't believe, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Singapore, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, that's it. We were amongst top 20 least corrupt countries in 2010. That's one example. What, this is what I mean by Georgian style reform. Second example is doing business report. I don't know if you know it or not, but the World Bank produces this doing business report, which I believe is quite good parameter how to identify countries' uh, situation and countries' uh, rules and regulations. And according to the doing business report, Georgia was 112th in 2004. Uh, only within five years' time, Georgia was in top 10. Georgia was number eight. And Georgia was the only country, and until now is the only developing country reaching top 10 in this report, since this report exists. So number one is Singapore, number two is New Zealand, Hong Kong, UK, United States, uh, Finland, South Korea, Georgia. And this is 
This is type of reforms that I'm talking about. And governments need and have to adapt these reforms as soon as possible if they want to survive. If they don't do this, there will be a worse and worse situation in many developing countries because money will not be coming. Money will be going to the developed world. Of course, there are new developing banks, there's Chinese, Asian. This money maybe will balance out these private investment funds at some, some period of time, but eventually the uh, end result will definitely be that there will be less and less money flowing towards inefficient governments, inefficient economies. And there will be more money flowing towards California, uh, United States in total, UK and so on and so on. This type of reforms that I'm talking about is actually the bottlenecks private sector. It actually makes SMEs and private sector much more active and they contribute to the economy and they bring themselves FDI and they bring themselves uh, international investors and then know-how transfer. But what about IFIs? What can IFIs do in this kind of situation? And uh, uh, I'll try to be brief. I, I, don't, I don't think I have much, uh, much time. But I think that there, is, there are new policies that IFI needs to adapt as soon as possible. And these are, uh, these are uh, di three or four different directions just to give you ideas of, of, of possible IFI de uh, development. One is IPPP, which is I call IFI public-private partnership. There is less money flowing towards developing f f countries. We need IFIs to give some kind of assurances, some kind of guarantees to private sector to invest to developing world. They don't need to cough out whole money themselves, IFIs. They don't have unlimited resources either. All they need is to give political insurance, insurances to in international investors for international investors, private sector, to become more and more active towards developing, towards developing world. We need IFIs to help governments to create so-called PME sector. And this is also a new term. It's uh, publicly traded medium-sized companies. IFIs like EBRD and World Bank need to co-finance or finance transformation of so-called family type of companies into corporations in developing world because this is not happening. This is, this is something where developing countries have got stuck. Even in Eastern Europe, which is much more developed than Africa or many uh, former Soviet Union countries, even in Eastern Europe, we have a problem of transforming family type of companies into corporations. It's not happening. In Hungary, it's not happening. In Bulgaria, it's not happening. So we need IFIs helping this, with this transformation, which also will bring additional investors and which also will bring additional uh, FDI to developing world. And finally, we need IFIs helping private sector with transformation of state-owned enterprises. I believe that state-owned enterprises in developing countries is the biggest inefficiency of the world. I believe the world is losing huge potential growth, additional, maybe one third at least of current growth, which is not utilized because of corruption or because of inefficiencies of state-owned enterprises of developing countries. And if, if you fix that, you will have much faster growth and much better, uh, better investment attraction. So I'm talking about IFIs working harder and better with the state-owned enterprises in the developing countries. Uh, we need new formulas for PPPs. And by the way, I've seen many PPPs gone wrong. PPP is like, if PPP goes wrong, it's like bad marriage. It's, you, you are stuck with persons that you don't want to live with, but uh, divorce is very costly. By the way, I'm, I'm very happily married. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but like, I've, I've seen, I've heard these stories. So wrongly arranged PPP is a disaster for a country, and I've seen that. And wrongly arranged PPP, why PPPs go wrong? Uh, main reason why they go, go wrong is because of corruption, actually. Because of not transparent and not competitive uh, process that has been managed for the PPP. So I believe that uh, big IFI's introduction of more active into PPP arrangement can, should, be, should play a very significant role. Um, and finally, 
And by the way, this is, uh, if anybody will be interested, uh, you will be able to find this on, on the website. Uh, this is a formula that we are saying that in practice, this formula works very well because we've done it in Georgia a few times. This is, this is formula for PPP, which gives equal opportunity to all pot potential investors, which develops a new product and which brings new investors into the investments into the country. Just briefly explain what, 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 we, what I mean by that. For example, when we wanted to build one of the largest hydropower plants in Georgia, we created a state-owned company uh, and we gave all the licenses, permits, land, everything to this company. By the way, this is the portion of development of any project which all of the investors hate. The first six months, for first nine months of the project development is hated by all the investors because this is time when investors have to go to many, many different agencies and many, many different ministries. So government does all that, then does a roadshow, attracts best possible uh, co-investors uh, from private sector, and has an auction saying that I'm selling 51% of this, pro of the, of this uh, project, I'm going to co-finance, but whoever will um, offer to buy higher percent of this company will win this company. Whoever will make me put less money will win this project. And with this auction, you actually have very f identify very, very fair value of the project and gets private sector gets the project to develop, but private sector has an obligation to buy government out without, within five years' time. And then this money goes to new project. So this is type of formulas that we are talking about, which I believe will lead into bringing new types of investors into developing world and will, may avoid this kind of uh, catastrophic situation which may happen because of technological development. And finally, this is the last slide, finally I believe that it's time to develop investor banking boutiques which are very much focused on PPP projects because these are very difficult transactions in many cases and these are transactions which, where I believe governments need significant help. And we in Reformatics, actually, we have already created a new company called 3P Reformatics where we, where we are starting also to work with governments on developing new PPP projects. So this is, I hope, these are type of scenarios and ways how to avoid drastic decrease of foreign direct investors investments into the developing world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Gilauri. That is a so, sort of coincidence, you know, today we, were, we are spoken on the changing world and what is not going to be like it was before. And I see that even yesterday changes announced here by Mr. Uh, by former Prime Minister of the UK, what did Trump in the United States? Maybe all these things are coming, uh, are coming from the fundamental changes in the world's economy. You know. We were mentioning today that the inequality is growing up here. Yep. We were mentioning that the FDI inflows into the developed countries are bigger, are getting bigger and bigger than, uh, than to, to the not developed countries. You know. And now you are mentioning that the, there are technological changes also, and these measures of protections, maybe they are going to protect the technology yep. now, because the world was technology producers and users is going to be to be a wall between them, maybe, probably, we don't know. And thank you to share with us your view. So I'm now I'm as asking the audience if you have any questions, please, please. Thank you very much, Chris Mamadi from Afghanistan. Uh, you said that uh, if there is a competition of corruption, you will win, but I say, no, we will win, you will not. <laughs> yeah. uh, when it comes to copying or in, uh, somehow following other countries and their practices in terms of fighting corruption in our country, we have been doing that for a while. I'm working for customs department, and you know that's the most- That's the worst, department. yes. <laughs> customs, I think customs is the same everywhere. It's just- <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, we uh, had a delegation coming to your country. They visited, and we also got uh, some copies, and we went to your websites, uh, copied some of the strategic plans and all those things. 
in order to draft a, a national counter-corruption strategy for Afghanistan. But it didn't work. Uh, maybe it wasn't because the strategies were not uh, right, but it was because we didn't have a national, uh, uh, a national unity in implementing that strategy. I want to know the core reason because of which you could counter corruption in your country, which is not policies, definitely, which is something maybe different, mm -hmm. like uh, you have a unity or you have a single political thought that you will have to do this thing. What was that? Actually, about Afghanistan, yes, it's, it's a very difficult country. I've been there, by the way, many times. Uh, I had a contract there just recently. Uh, for four, we have a very short contract. We have a four-month contract with the president's office, President Ghani's office. I met him a few times, and uh, he's a very impressive guy, by the way. I was very impressed with him. Although I have to say that the yeah, situation is not easy, and I believe that it, it will take a long time for, for Afghanistan to achieve similar results that, that we've done in Georgia for different reasons. Amongst others, yes, there is no unity in the country, and this is the problem of not having unity. If you're asking what we've done in Georgia to, to fight corruption successfully, um, I believe that there are a few major aspects. It's not one aspect. One is that because we were so corrupt, Georgia was so corrupt, actually we were, government was given a full mandate saying that do whatever you want, just get rid of corruption. It was, the population was really fed up. And what happened in 2003, actually this, I don't know if you know or not, Rose Revolution happened, which was not fully revolution, but oh, quasi-revolution, where actually population came out in the streets and said, get rid of corruption, do whatever you want. For example, and we did drastic measures, which I believe you need to do in Afghanistan. And, and there are very rare countries where I advise drastic measures, and Afghanistan is one of them. Maybe, maybe maximum five countries that are in the world right now where I would advise to do drastic measures. And what do I mean by drastic measures? For example, we fired every single traffic policeman in one day. Wow. All of them. And by the way, tra traffic was much better. <laughs> without traffic policemen, traffic was much better. We had three months without traffic policemen. And we recruited totally new people from nowhere, from zero. In energy sector, I fired 3,000 people. And I especially brought, as a heads of companies, non-energy people. The worst directors of hospitals are doctors. The worst directors of energy companies are energy engineers. You need to bring managers who will actually fight against corruption rather than specialists of that particular field. Uh, we, for example, customs. When I become Minister of Finance, the only reason why I became Minister of Finance was customs, actually, because I fought very successfully corruption in energy sector, and I was given this task that be to become Minister of Finance only to get rid of corruption in, in, in customs. And it was really the worst uh, corrupt. I mean, literally, they would actually put cash on a table at, 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 at the end of the day and kind of yeah. divide up cash between each other. I mean, literally, this was the case. So what we did uh, here, uh, in, in customs, we had a different approach. And corruption lasted longer than in c police. Why? In customs, we said that uh, we cannot fire all of them because this is some kind of um, knowledge. So we have to bring new guys. So what was happening is that new guys were brought. The old guys realized that new guys are there to replace them. And old guys would teach corruption to new guys. <laughs> and we would actually put in prison new guys. Because we would, because they were inexperienced, and we would, we would catch them. So I, I had to, I had to replace big part of customs. That's one. Second, I had to get rid of brokers. Brokers are biggest corruption in your country. Why? Because they are, it's it's official corruption. But I don't know custom of, a, yeah, custom brokers. I don't know of a custom broker who is not either member of family of customs officer or ex customs officer himself. Yeah. And this is done. So we, I get rid of brokers. That's two. Third, what I did there, I created a special department which would go to neighboring country, Azerbaijan, for example, bring products with a camera and give a bribe to customs officer. If customs officer with a camera, if customs, customs officer takes a bribe, he goes to prison for five years. That's very clear. Everybody knew that. 
They said, this is, that's it. Everybody knows that if you take a bribe, you go to prison for five years. It's a $100 bribe, $120 bribe. Second version is the customs officer doesn't take a bribe, but still customs clears the goods. So we have him for another checkup for future. Third is customs officer doesn't take a bribe and calls special department saying that he's been offered a bribe. At that moment, minister calls him with a thanking. He gets a four months bonus, four months salary bonus, and he gets promotion. Within six to nine months of practicing this, I had the cleanest customs department in the world. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I can tell you many, many stories, and, and there are very particular cases for each particular uh, department, how we fought corruption, but the main idea is the following. Main idea is that if your customs officer or your uh, agency specialist, doesn't matter, whoever, earns $20 a month, which was the case in Georgia in the past, don't expect him not to take bribes. He has to survive. And if this person looks in a mirror in the, in the morning and says that if I don't take bribe, my family will starve to death, that's it. He will take a bribe because nobody, uh, otherwise it's impossible. And, uh, it's, you know, there was kind of soci social consensus in Georgia that, yeah, of course they have to take bribe. Otherwise, how can, how can they survive? And you have to take away this moral argument. It has to be immoral to take bribes. And you can only achieve that if he has normal salary. That's one. Mm -hmm. Second, okay. uh, sorry, second, bonuses. Give bonuses to public servants. If they take bonuses for b better services, they will, they will not take bribes. And third, very string, strong stick. If we're talking about carrots and sticks, mm -hmm. if they take bribes, they go to prison. It doesn't matter who they are. They are brother or sister or a, of a prime minister or whoever it is, they take a bribe, they go to prison. That's, that's the basic rule. Okay, any other questions? Please. Hello, my name is Alexander from Germany. You mentioned that uh, now Georgia had, or the, the last uh, survey you mentioned, they had 4% had paid a bribe to someone, and that you mentioned a couple of other big countries who had similar or yeah. slightly higher rate. Do you believe it is possible to achieve a lower than 2% corruption rate? Uh, <laughs> or is that just... I don't think it's possible. I, I, don't, I don't think it's possible. I, I think that corruption will always be. It's just a matter of level of corruption. I believe that somebody somewhere will always give some bribe. It's impossible to totally root it out from everybody. Even a clean country like Germany has problems. And we, we, we've seen uh, problems of one of the largest companies of German companies in Africa. We've seen uh, one of the cleanest uh, non-corrupt countries, by the way, is South Korea, and we've seen uh, corruption scandals in South Korea. So it's impossible to totally root it out. Mm -hmm. Something that will be there. But the main question is, how much does it affect economy? How much does it affect society? How much it pushes back the country's development? And when we were talking about countries like Afghanistan, when we were talking countries like Africa, and many, many countries in Africa, we are talking that corruption actually stops development of these countries doesn't allow these societies to, to, to grow, to, to develop. And this is, the, this is the biggest problem right now, I think, for the world. Okay, yep. please. Yeah, I, I am Mr. Stevan. I am the rector of the ICB. Uh, well, I'm not gonna, what you speaker, you spoke about the, the, this case in Afghanistan regarding, for example, to take away people from engineers, for example, from uh, you know energy and so on. In these cases, I'm not going to go through because I don't have the no knowledge of that. But I think, uh, the mo of course, uh, I know that it shouldn't be so radical, you know, because uh, it should be, I, I think it should be a balance at the end. Because, for example, I'm going to give you another, uh, one example. Uh, I did my, uh, one Erasmus in Finland. And for example, in Finland, uh, the people who is in charge of the education are mainly professors. And as you may know, is one of the most successful, you know, educational systems in the world. Yep. I think it should be a balance. I always say one thing: if I'm going to the do uh, if I have a pain in my feet, I'm going to the dentist, and if I have a problem with my car, I'm going to the mechanic, to the mechanic. I never do the opposite. I'm going to the dentist for a problem with my definitely. Car. Uh, so but but do you know who is who is the owner of the dentist? Do you know who is the owner of that building? 
Ja. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. It does not mean that the manager who manages the salaries, who manages the policies, who, who that has to be a dentist. It doesn't mean. Believe me. And maybe. Maybe yes, please don't don't misunderstand. Me. Yeah, absolutely. So it's 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 all about policy decision making, which I'm saying that it doesn't have to be dentist, doesn't have to be doctor, doesn't have to be an in engineer. Uh, it has can be it has to be good manager. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Please. Uh, yeah, Joseph in California, United States. Um, so thank you uh, for uh, sharing your story, and then also, of course, uh, your very successful reforms. Um, my question would be, what would be uh, the dangers or the threats or obstacles for, as we know, the majority of the world, which is which is in the red in, uh, in transparency and corruption, that leaders will face in implementing um, your, your playbook? Uh, very good question. And I have to say that the biggest obstacle that was to us when we were doing reforms, it was our own bureaucrats our own government members, our own deputy ministers, our own heads of agency. You see, in nature, bureaucrats are risk covers in nature. If you are risk taker, you go to private sector. Bureaucrats are in nature risk covers, one. And second, in nature, they don't like changes, any kind of changes. They are scared of changes. So every time where we are advising prime minister to do the reforms, I am always, always finishing my presentation with one sentence. By the way, the biggest problem you're going to face, it's not going to be population, it's not going to be opposition, it's not going to be part of it, it's going to be your own ministers and deputy ministers. So you have to win the war against your own ministers, deputy ministers, and bureaucrats, and only after that you'll be able to do the reforms. So in order to do these reforms, you need two things. One, you need political will at the top that he wants to change, and second, you need to have team afterwards who will actually in, in, implement this, who will be on your side. In Georgia was very lucky at that time that th these three things, these few things happened at the same time. We had a very capable head of state who wanted to change. We had a very capable team who actually implemented this. And we had a huge support from society, from from whole whole country to do that. So that's why can you imagine firing all traffic policemen? I mean, all of them came out in the streets, and it's, by the way, it's a dangerous thing, don't do that. Because, because they have guns at the same time, so they can actually create a revolution. They came out, all of them, in the streets and started protesting. But within two hours, they go, went home because they realized that nobody was supporting them. They were so much hated by society that they actually got scared and they went home. They realized that there was no chance that they could do anything. So, I mean, this support from population, political will, and capable team is, is a formula for that. And uh, the biggest opposition, the biggest obstacle will be the government uh, itself, in, in itself, bureaucrats, second layer bureaucrats, most of the time. So, any other question? Oh, I have a question. You could yes. You know, you know, I was the Prime Minister of Armenia making this liberal reforms at the very beginning of the 90s. And yep. Armenia was number one in the world. Well, and we, well, unfortunately, we, we, we had economic growth in 1994, and then we have energy sector reform. We became exporter of electricity. But because of some political reasons, uh, you know, in the late 90s, Armenia changed its, its policy and became, became less and less attractive on that. You know. In my lectures, I'm including special chapter in Georgia showing you what happened. But I see three problems in Georgia. Mm -hmm. I would like to know your belief yep. to those to those problems. The first one is extreme poverty, eight percent. Mm -hmm. Poverty generally twenty percent. Extreme poverty is uh, uh, seven. Actually, four. Eight. I know eight. Okay. Know the database of two or sixteen is eight point nine. Okay. Okay. The second issue in Georgia is on south. How you saw the, the, the uh, you bring down the taxation, you have something like different taxes, 16 or you have four, just four. Yep. It is clear, it is transparent. But after that, you had a relative decrease of uh, of, of the revenues of the budget. Uh, to be frank with you, we cannot improve, improve it too much. Because of that, you have 
very low level of salaries. And the third issue is the structure of the economy, which is now very well specialized on tourism, etc., etc. And having a look to the life structure, technology, etc., etc., I didn't feel too much that, that it's, it's going better. Could you share sure. with us your point of view Absolutely. On, on these three questions? Absolutely. Very good. Very, very good three questions. Um, first of all, uh, let me start with taxes. Oh, yeah. Yes, we brought down taxes. By the way, we had 21 different taps, taxes. All of them were crazy high. We realized that no, no, no company can pay them all. It was specially done. It was because of corruption. You cannot pay all of them. But you pay how much depending on how much bribe you give to a tax officer. So tax office, actually paying taxes was very simple in Georgia. Go, tax officer comes to you and they, you discuss, you actually bargain how much you will give him as a person and how much you pay taxes. So we brought down 21 taxes. We, we brought down to six, now it's to five. Only f we have right now five taxes, all of them are flat, all of them are low. And tax revenue to GDP went from 7% to 24%, okay? It's according to the World Bank figures. In, in nominal terms, we collected within five years' time, we collected 10 times more taxes than before the reform. Before we had 21 taxes, and when we changed this, this reform, all tax rates were brought down at the same time. So nothing went up. So with this, only due to taking out corruption, only due to Laffer curve, I mean, situation, effect, and only due to better administration, we started collecting more. Now, uh, government salaries are not high, but they're not very low either. I, I wouldn't believe that they are very low. But we have a very good bonus system. Now, it was my decision when I was prime minister. We saw that big, good guys of the government were leaving for private sector. And it was a big problem because we didn't want to let them go. But at the same time, we couldn't give, take salaries high up, up to everybody because it was a huge budgetary burden. And we would go above 30% of budget to GDP. And I believe that countries like Georgia cannot go above 27, 28% of, of budget to GDP because it has its own big effect on the, on the economy, big, bad effect on the economy. So what we did, we created a bonus system. So I believe that in any ministry, only five people work. Doesn't matter how big the ministry is. <laughs> only five people work. And you need to keep these five people happy. <laughs> these are the decision makers. Okay? Everybody else work on these five people. Or don't do anything. Most of the time, don't do anything. So for these five people, actually, we create a special bonus system. <laughs> and these bonuses are very high. Uh, and they, they are happy. They don't leave the, the governments. About poverty, um, I think I have different figures of the World Bank. Uh, uh, according to these figures, only in two years' time, extreme poverty. Extreme poverty. Only in two years' time, it's in its period of 2010 2012, extreme poverty went down from 7% to 4%. Only in two years' time. And, I'll tell you, and right now it remains around 4%. Of course it's the case. But I believe that we have quite interesting system. So we had all the different types of social social benefits, social benefit for uh, single mothers, social benefit for families with four children and more, social benefits for people who used to war, have a war in, in Second World War, and so on and so on. So we had like 20, any kind of social benefits, but all of them were very, very small, okay? So what we did, we said that we totally scrapped this social benefit system, and we said, whoever is poor will get the social benefit. That's it. And how we, how we identify that, we create a formula, which I believe works quite well, which right now World Bank wants to use this formula in other countries as well. It's actually based on your income, based on your, because you cannot really uh, identify true income in, in, in developing countries. So it's, a, it's based on your costs and your ownership. Costs of your electricity, gas, mobile phone, of, any, of, of your bills, and of your ownership whatever you own. Based on that, we identified the uh, poorest part of society, approximately, uh, if I remember properly, 20% of the population, because we had that much money for them. We gave them cash, and we gave them health care vouchers and get insurance. So with that, we pulled out uh, extreme poverty 
from 7%, we could decrease it to 4 I believe that this government has a very good chance to take it one step further and totally eliminate uh, extreme poverty if they continue with the same policy but a little bit increase the cash benefits. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr.